Hello and welcome to the review of the next portion of the cardiovascular physiology chapter of chapter 4 from Costanzo's physiology textbook. In this portion we're going over the cardiac muscle and contractility and also a little bit on cardiac output as well. If you enjoy the video please don't forget to give it a like and if you're in need of the textbook there is a link within the description. So as with skeletal muscle our cardiac muscle is made up of our sarcomeres, which consists of thick filaments with the myosin heads, which attach to the thin filaments or the actin portion of the thin filament, which is also made out of tropomyosin and also troponin as well. Remember, troponin, which is this kind of three protein structure, attaches onto both the tropomyosin with troponin T and also actin with troponin I with this third component of troponin C which binds to calcium to then move the tropomyosin off the active sites of the actin to then allow the binding with the myosin heads. That then allows the cross bridge cycling or the sliding filament model and contraction to occur. The cardiac myocytes also have T tubules which are invaginations of the cell membrane at the Z line bringing the action potential down allowing these diagnostics adds to form with the sarcoplasmic reticulum which then allows calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and excitation contraction coupling. So to go over this again very briefly we have our cardiac action potential which remember from the previous chapter is slightly different to our skeletal muscle which actually brings in calcium into the cell during the plateau phase or phase two of their cardiac action potential that calcium that enters then comes in through the dihydropyridine receptors or the L-type calcium channels in the T-tubules which are then connected to the ranadine receptors of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There's this calcium-induced calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum which then allows calcium to bind to troponin C moves those tropomyosins out of the way. Cross-bridge cycling can occur between the myosin and the actin which then allows tension to occur. Relaxation occurs once calcium is reuptaked by a calcium ATPase on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And once all the intracellular calcium is reduced, then calcium unbinds from our troponin C and tropomyosin once again covers up the actin so the active sites are no longer available and we have relaxation. So that is the basics of contractility and relaxation as well. Now contractility is called inotropism. So positive inotropes means an increase in contractility due to whatever agent and then negative inotropy means that a particular agent or medication reduces our contractility. There's also other ways to change our contractility as well but it directly correlates with our intracellular calcium. So anything that's able to increase our intracellular calcium will increase contractility. So how would we be able to go about that? There's really these two factors. The size of the inward calcium current during the plateau phase of the action potential. So any action potential which is able to bring in more calcium and then also how much calcium is stored within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if there's a lot of calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, once it's stimulated to release, we're going to have increased intracellular calcium, which can also be stimulated by the more inward calcium current. And then we have a larger intracellular calcium concentration to allow a stronger contractility. So that's where the sympathetic nervous system comes in and its positive inotropic effect because it's able to actually increase the contractility of the heart through increased peak tension, increased rate of tension, and faster rate of relaxation, which is the flip side of contractility. We obviously need to relax faster if we're going to be contracting both faster and then also harder. Um, and it's able to do that through the beta receptors, mainly beta-1 receptors, which ultimately phosphorylates various proteins to then increase our calcium concentration and also increase the amount of calcium that's able to be reuptaked by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which helps with relaxation. So the proteins which are phosphorylated include the L-type calcium channels, which carry in the inward calcium current, so more is entered during the action potential, 
Since more is entered during the action potential, more is stimulated to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but there's also now more calcium within the intracellular space to be then reuptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this increased inward calcium current will increase the amount of calcium now available for the following beat through increased cycling. There's phosphorylation also of phospholambin, which is the calcium ATPase that reuptakes calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that allows relaxation to occur faster because calcium is quickly taken out of the cell once relaxation occurs. But also there's a lot more calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum now for the next contraction. So that actually results in this trepe formation or bow ditch staircase. So you can see with an increased heart rate due to sympathetic stimulation, we start to have increased calcium cycling within the cell. So with an increase in heart rate, following that first beat, we start to get a steady increase in tension or contractility up to a plateau because we start to have increased calcium cycling throughout the cell. Now the parasympathetic nervous system actually reduces or has a negative inotropic effect on the atria specifically. It does not influence our contractility on our ventricles because it doesn't have receptors there. It's mainly got its receptors on the atria, sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node to slow down the heart rate and reduce our contractility within our atria through the muscarinic receptors. And it reduces the calcium current during the plateau phase of the action potential and also increases the amount of potassium leaving the cell. So then that shortens the actual duration of the action potential. So then there's once again less calcium within the cell of the atria only. So then the contractility of the atria reduces. So another effect of heart rate on contractility, we talked about the bow ditch staircase effect, which mainly happens during sympathetic stimulation with that increase in heart rate. We also have this post extrasystolic potentiation. And what this means is that if you have an extra systole or an ectopic beat so the heart contracts prematurely from either an atrial premature beat or a ventricular premature beat we now have increased at calcium cycling within the cell for the following beat so that's this post extra systole so you can see that the next beat has this increased tension formation because there is now increased calcium cycled within the cell this extra little beat here it doesn't have an increased contractility because there's not any extra calcium within the cell for this portion. There's actually a little bit less because this beat has used the calcium. That calcium is now trying to cycle back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It hasn't quite reached the portion of the sarcoplasmic reticulum for next release. So when there's this extra systole, there's now less calcium within the cell. So there's a little bit of a less tension formed or less contractility. But now we have also added in a little bit more calcium into the cell for the following beat because of the action potential, that plateau phase. So now we have the calcium from this beat and the calcium from the extra systole sitting within the sarcoplasmic reticulum ready for that post extra systole. So we now have increased calcium within the cell. Something that may help with actually learning this is that this post extra systole is usually actually a little bit later on in time. So the extra systole occurs there's usually a little bit of a time delay before the next post extra systole called a compensatory pause. So then there is more calcium ready for the following beat. It then returns to normal afterwards as calcium cycling returns to normal because we haven't got phosphorylation of all the different proteins. That was only an increased calcium because of just an extra beat. Cardiac glycosides are a positive inotropic drug which comes from the foxglove plant called digitalis. And the actual drug prototype is called digoxin. So it actually does this easily shown on this other figure over here, where on the cell membrane, remember we have our sodium potassium ATPase pump that's helping to establish a sodium concentration gradient outside the cell and also the potassium concentration gradient within the cell. We also, just on the side, we have the sodium calcium exchanger which can actually flip back and forth depending on which concentration of the ion is greatest. What it does is actually moves sodium typically down its concentration gradient from outside to inside to then exchange for calcium to leave the cell. 
So it helps to remove calcium from the cell. So it helps with relaxation, but it also reduces the calcium concentration within the cell. But if we're actually able to block the sodium potassium ATPase pump with our cardiac glycosides, then sodium no longer leaves the cell. So then our actual sodium concentration within the cell increases. So now the sodium that's going through the exchanger, that concentration gradient from the outside to the inside for sodium is significantly reduced. So now there's less sodium entering the cell, which corresponds to less calcium leaving the cell through this exchanger. So now our calcium is going to sit within the cell, since the exchanger is not taking it, increasing the calcium within the cell which has a positive inotropic effect as we've already talked about. So that's our cardiac muscle and cardiac contractility. So next that brings us to the discussion around cardiac output and also discussing pressure volume loops as well. So starting with our length tension relationship of our cardiac muscle, you can see that with increasing our individual cardiac myocyte length through an increased diastolic volume, results in an increase in pressure or an increase in tension that's able to be formed. It obviously plateaus and actually starts to reduce a little bit as those actin and myosin filaments get spread apart and now there is even less actin and myosin overlapping if you keep stretching out that cardiac muscle. And then at this plateau phase, that is when there is a, the best degree of overlap between the actin and myosin. So there is optimal cross bridge formation able to occur. And then down the ascending limb, we're now getting shorter and shorter and there's less actin and myosin being overlapped. Remember, we went over this with skeletal muscle as well. Now with the heart, we usually operate on this ascending limb because it's stiffer. So it's actually harder to get it on the descending limb because it's harder to stretch those cardiac muscles apart. So we're usually operating up here on this ascending limb. And another component of our cardiac muscle length tension relationship is that by increasing muscle length, not only do we optimize the actin myosin crossover, we also increase the calcium sensitivity of troponin C and also increase the calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we've got multiple factors here to increase our contractility of our heart muscle or increase the tension that's able to be formed. And that length tension relationship is called the Frank Starling relationship, which has a similar curve to this one outlined up the top here. It's actually more linear and then curves and then plateaus since we don't really operate on that descending limb. This bottom curve down the bottom here is really just showing us the passive pressure that's formulated within diastole with an increasing volume. So this is just diastolic pressure, and then this is the systolic pressure that's able to be generated, or contractility. We then have these two terms called preload and afterload, similar to our skeletal muscle, but specific to our cardiac muscle. Preload means the left ventricular end diastolic volume, so it's represented by this curve. So this is our preload. So if we have a higher preload or higher end diastolic volume, we have a higher pressure. Afterload for the left ventricle does not relate to this curve. You'll see it come up later on in this video. Afterload is our aortic pressure. That is the amount of pressure that the ventricle has to generate to actually push blood out of the aorta. So if you could imagine that if aortic pressure is zero or afterload is zero, then our cardiac muscle is able to open up the aortic valve and actually shorten faster. So the velocity for shortening is maximal when afterload is zero. Whereas as afterload increases or the aortic pressure increases, then it's harder, it takes a lot of pressure to then push that blood out of the aortic valve and so our velocity shortening decreases. So you're able to increase the velocity of shortening by reducing our aortic pressure. So that gets us to the function of our ventricles. There's really these three functions. We've got stroke volume, which is the amount of blood or volume of blood ejected by the ventricle with each heartbeat. Ejection fraction is just the portion of the end diastolic volume that's ejected with each stroke volume. And then our cardiac output, which is the actual volume ejected 
per unit of time or usually over a minute. So stroke volume over heart rate. So you can see that with these equations here, stroke volume equals our N diastolic volume minus our N systolic volume, just giving us how much volume was ejected in that one beat. Ejection fraction is our stroke volume, so the amount that was ejected divided by the end diastolic volume, it's just a fraction, and then our cardiac output is actually just stroke volume times our heart rate. We're just trying to see how much volume is ejected per minute. So here's looking at our Frank Starling relationship. So you can see that this is our typical curve here, which is slightly different to our curve over here. This kind of describes it a lot better. So you can see that with an increased volume, we're able to increase our cardiac output over an increased volume. Now this graph is representing what happens when we give a positive inotropic drug, then we're going to increase just the entire curve, the entire frank starling relationship up. If we have a negative inotropic drug, we're going to reduce it down. So basically any positive inotropic drug is going to be able to increase the cardiac output per unit volume. So if we have, let's say just right here, this volume and where the pen is, you can see with the control, our cardiac output is at one portion. With positive inotropic drug, it is higher. With a negative inotropic drug, it is lower. So this is really just showing us the volume of blood that is ejected by the ventricle, which is determined by the volume present in the ventricle at end diastole. And it's like that because our cardiac output has to equal our venous return because we need to be able to eject the same amount of blood out of the heart as what enters the heart. So that's why we have this relationship. Now down the bottom here, we have our pressure volume loop. Now this is a pretty important kind of cardiac physiology diagram. It may start to get a little bit complicated if you dive too deep into it, but essentially, see this little kind of square here? This fits into this diagram. So this bottom curve, is going across here and eventually would come up. So if there's an increase in volume, this entire bottom portion would shift up the curve. And then this orange line here is actually represented by this curve over here. So if there is any increase in contractility, similar to this Frank Starling curve, we would increase the curve up. So then this curve would just completely shift up. But before getting too complicated into those mechanisms, so I just wanted to actually show you how this diagram kind of fits in there. We usually represent it with these two curves going, one going this way, and then actually you can see the entire kind of cardiac output or contractility curve up the top here. So to actually describe this pressure volume loop, we have different phases. This is just one cardiac cycle. So this bottom curve here is showing us diastole. So we have an increase in volume of blood over time as diastole progresses. Number one is now representing the starting of contraction, the starting of systole. We have an increase in pressure within the ventricle without any reduction in volume because we have isovolume contraction. The heart has to contract until the pressure within the left ventricle reaches the same pressure as the aortic valve or the aortic pressure to open up the aortic valve. Once the aortic valve is open, we then have a continuation of contraction, but also an ejection of blood through the aortic valve leaflets. So our volume actually starts to reduce over time until the aortic valve closes to mark the start of diastole. So we no longer are contracting now. So this entire portion from one to three is systole, but we are only ejecting blood for a portion of it. Now, once we are actually entering diastole, we have a reduction in pressure over time until the left ventricle reduces low enough for the mitral valve to now open. So it has to go from usually, you know, around about 120 all the way down to around about five millimeters of mercury to keep it simple, to let the mitral valve open, which then allows blood to enter the cell during diastole, which then finishes off our curve. So this is one cardiac cycle. We have diastole, isovolumic contraction, we have ejection, and then we have isovolumic relaxation. So you could imagine that different factors can change how this little uh, diagram 
looks and that sh is shown down here in figure 4.24 where we have an increased preload remember increased preload just means increased end diastolic volume so now we're going to move across on this imaginary line here that i'd mentioned we're going to move up that imaginary line so then we're going to have this diastolic volume increase over time now we are starting at a higher volume when we're starting contraction so then our iso volume and contraction occurs we still open the aortic valve leaflets at the same time because the aortic pressure hasn't changed and then we have a stronger ejection we have an increased cardiac output remember because of the frank starling relationship so then we end up at the same point when isovolumic relaxation time occurs so the main thing that's changed here is that the actual width of the little diagram here the width of this pressure volume loop has increased which represents our stroke volume so stroke volume has increased remember stroke volume is just end diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume the next example is increased afterload which is just increasing the aortic pressure so now the aortic valve leaflets won't open for a longer period of time we have to increase the pressure generated in the left ventricle to open up the aortic valve leaflets so the first change is that point number two increases we have to generate more pressure to open up the aortic valve leaflets that reduces the time of ejection so ejection occurs and then it suddenly stops earlier short of the previous uh, marker so we now have to stop on a dime here where you if you imagine that imaginary line that was here we're still stopping on that same contractility line because contractility hasn't reduced which means that our stroke volume has reduced because now isovolumic relaxation time occurs in the normal diastole as well so the only main change here is that stroke volume has reduced by increasing our afterload which makes sense because our shortening velocity has also reduced we have less time for ejection because it takes longer for the aortic valve leaflets to actually open and then the last example here is increased contractility and that's moving the imaginary line that we had here up you know similar to that frank starling relationship increasing that cardiac output so we're moving the imaginary line over here which then allows ejection to occur more vigorously and then we actually have an increased stroke volume because we are now having a larger ejection phase normal isovolumic relaxation and then a larger diastole because we now have increased cardiac output so venous return will increase on the same token as well so now our stroke volume has increased altogether and then an important concept with these pressure volume loops is work so if you did actually have an imaginary line here and then we've got this other imaginary line down the bottom here our internal work is represented by this portion here and then our external work is that portion there external work is our stroke volume so external work is the stroke volume essentially it's the work that the heart has done to actually eject blood our internal work is actually the heat generated by the heart muscle essentially the work that is done that does not contribute to the ejection of blood so as you can see with the increase of afterload since our curve here has stayed in a similar location our internal work has now increased by increasing afterload so we've generated more heat and less work has contributed to our actual stroke volume or external work so the heart muscle itself has actually become less efficient because more energy is used to just overcome that increased afterload so that brings us to myocardial oxygen consumption which really just correlates to cardiac minutes work so our definitions here really quickly work is just force times distance and in terms of the heart it is just the actual work that the heart performs of each beat minute work is therefore the work per unit of time and can be represented by cardiac output times our aortic pressure so our myocardial oxygen consumption is directly correlated with our cardiac minute work so we have these two components of cardiac minute work we've got the external work that we talked about which is essentially our stroke volume or another name for it is volume work 
And then we have our internal work or the heat. Remember that work that we have to overcome, which is also called pressure work. So pressure work is our internal work. Volume work is our external work. When it comes to myocardial oxygen consumption, pressure work or internal work is much more costly than volume work. So if anything increases pressure work, so increased afterload such as aortic stenosis or systemic hypertension, we are then increasing the myocardial oxygen consumption because we have to generate such high pressures to pump blood. When it comes to strenuous exercise, we're actually increasing our volume work relative to our pressure work because we are increasing our stroke volume through an increased contractility. So since we're increasing external work, we actually have a lower increase in myocardial oxygen demand even though we are increasing the work of the heart. So anything that increases pressure work is going to be more costly versus increasing volume work when it comes to oxygen consumption. Now that also just applies to the left versus right ventricle. Obviously our left ventricle has to generate higher pressures. It gets up to 120 millimeters of mercury in a normal person versus the right side of the heart that has to generate lower pressures or just around about 25 millimeters of mercury. So our oxygen consumption of the left side is higher. So compensatory hypertrophy, which is how the heart remodels to an increase in pressure can be explained by the law of Laplace, which is represented by this equation, where pressure of a sphere, or in this case, our ventricle, equals two times the thickness of the sphere, or the ventricle, times the tension that it can generate, divided by the radius. So if we have an increase in pressure that we have to generate in the left ventricle because of, let's say, systemic hypertension or increased afterload, then we then have to increase our thickness of our heart muscle and reduce our radius, resulting in concentric hypertrophy to then generate those pressures that we need in the sphere or generate the pressure within the left ventricle, which just explains our compensatory hypertrophy that we see with systemic hypertension. And then lastly here, what we're gonna go over for cardiac output is the thick principle, which is really just stating that there is a conservation of mass with cardiac output. So cardiac output can be defined as the volume of blood ejected by the left ventricle per unit of time, but it can actually be calculated by going stroke volume times heart rate. We've already gone over that, but in order to actually measure cardiac output, that's where this FIC principle comes into play. And it's important to know that the Fink principle assumes that the left and right ventricles cardiac output are equal. So since we know that their cardiac outputs are equal, then we know that the rate of oxygen that's consumed by the body is going to equal the amount of oxygen leaving the lungs on the pulmonary vein minus the amount of oxygen returning to the lungs in the pulmonary artery. So the amount of oxygen that is exchanging in the lungs must equal the oxygen consumed. So oxygen consumption equals the cardiac output times the oxygen in the pulmonary vein. So this is how much oxygen is leaving the lungs, which is obviously going to be the highest amount of oxygen, which has just been absorbed, minus the cardiac output times the oxygen concentration within the actual pulmonary artery. So that has come from the body. So now we know how much oxygen is being absorbed in the lungs, and therefore how much is being consumed by the body because in a steady state, we're going to absorb as much oxygen as we are consuming. So if we rearrange this equation now, we can then get cardiac output, which is equal to oxygen consumption divided by the concentration of oxygen in the pulmonary vein minus the concentration of the oxygen in the pulmonary artery. So this is just the thick principle. We can calculate our cardiac output by knowing what standard oxygen consumption is in the body, which is about 250 mils per minute in a 70 kilogram man, divided by the concentration of oxygen in the pulmonary vein, which can be obtained by taking a small arterial blood sample, and then minus the concentration of oxygen in the pulmonary artery, which can be obtained via catheterization of the right heart. So the FIC principle is probably a little bit more complicated than what you need to know, 
Obviously, it just depends on your course, but basically it's a way of measuring cardiac output by knowing your oxygen consumption in relative oxygen concentrations. So that's the end of this video for now. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to support the channel, get downloadable audio files of these chapters, you can do so in the Patreon link. Otherwise, drop a comment and we'll see you in the next video.